Uh, well, greetings and salutations. Uh, we are in our live stream overtime Zoom session. And it's mainly just a for people who might want to talk about things after our weekly live stream. So some things don't lend themselves well to the live stream. As much as I love Brian's whiteboard, sometimes a Zoom whiteboard is a little better. Anyways, what uh, we wanted to go over uh, right now is the difference between geos and revenues, and that's huge. They love the Excel format. Now, what I would recommend you do is take a sheet of paper and fold it in half. And on one side, write all the terms associated with general obligation bonds, go bonds. And on the other side, all the terms associated with revenue bonds. So we will play this game together. So I'm going to open up the chat. So who wants to begin with uh, something that goes with a geo and not a revenue or something that goes with a revenue and not a geo? Geos um, add valorem taxes. Right on. Let's just put taxes. Now, you brought up ad valorem taxes, and ad valorem taxes, that's Latin for added value, are primarily property taxes. Mm -hmm. And so if it's an ad valorem tax we're talking about, we're talking about local government. You know, taxes are the price you pay for civilization. And the more civilization you want, the more you're going to have to pay. And so that's typically what supports local government. Now, on the test, we refer to local governments as political subdivisions. So I'm coming to you from Clark County. Clark County is a political subdivision of uh, Nevada. And uh, I'm coming to you from Las Vegas. And Las Vegas is a political subdivision of Clark County. You know, uh, Nevada uh, states don't finance themselves with property taxes. You know, states finance themselves and other taxes. Uh, I am not in Nevada, coincidentally. I'm in Nevada because there's no state income tax. And I came from California where there is a huge state income tax. So the, primarily for the state, it's going to be an income and a sales tax. Now, if we're going to have a GO bond because of the property taxes, test question, we're going to need voter approval. You know, the voters, we got to make sure that the voters understand that they're on the hook for the borrowed money. And that is not true of a revenue bond, right? Revenue bonds are backed by user fees, very testable. If the user fees are insufficient, the bonds are going to default. And so the, since the taxpayers are not on the hook, there is no stickiness to the taxpayers. No voter approval is necessary. Now, we have a corporate finance. Corporate finance are men and women who raise money for corporations. Public finance are men and women who raise money for municipalities. And if I work public finance, I say, hey, mayor, what kind of airport would you like? I know you want to build a new airport. We love helping people like you build new airports because we love selling bonds. Now, what kind of airport would you like? Would you like a nice airport? a very nice airport or the nicest airport in the free world? He says, Dean, do I have to ask my voters? The answer is no. He says, wow, well, then give me the best, right? So revenue bonds do not require vote approval. Okay, so what are some other uh, things that go with either a GEO or a revenue? No, for revenue bonds, they include the trust indenture. Right on. Uh, let's just uh, let's just make an answer set out of that one, because we love Jeffrey to torment you on documents. And so let's just put some. Well, we're, you're correct here. The trust indenture. We would typically have a trust indenture for geo, but it's more important on the revenue uh, side of the the thing. A trust indenture is the written set of promises, the covenants between the issuer and the trustee. You know, you can imagine how popular I'd be if I say, hey, you vote for me, public transit is free. You know, we can't do that. What are some other documents that uh, we should be aware of as it relates to municipal bonds? Uh, another document we should be aware of is the official statement. 
Uh, another thing we should be aware of is the bond buyer. Uh, another thing we might want to be aware of is the notice of sale. Right? So you brought up the trust indenture, and one of the very important things in the trust indenture, which is very testable, and you're correct, uh, Jeffrey, that it does go on this side of it is what's called the flow of funds. The flow of funds. Remember we said the trust indenture is promises. So there's two types of uh, promises, pledges, as it relates to the flow of funds. What I mean, and when we're collecting money at the airport, you know, in the airport example, we're collecting the gate fees from the airline companies. We're collecting money from the parking structure. We're uh, collecting uh, perhaps uh, uh, lease payments from the people in the food court and uh, the retail stores, you know, money from the parking structure. Where does all that money go? And so what are the two, two types of pledges that we have in a uh, revenue bond? We have either net revenue or gross revenue. And that would be found in the trust indenture. Which one should we assume on the test? Which one should we assume on the test? We should assume net revenue. And under a net revenue pledge, which bond has priority? Or which, which account has priority? Very testable, the operations and maintenance fund. That has priority. And once we have enough to operate and maintain the air, uh, airport, then we'll start transferring money into debt service, the money we need to actually pay the interest and principal. Uh, you are correct. Cynthia says, Dean, debt service goes over here. She's correct. I'm not going to make you crunch debt service coverage ratio, but you know, the debt service coverage ratio goes with our revenue bond. So uh, what is the official statement about that? So for both GO and revenue bonds and the primary market for bonds, you know, we don't have prospectuses. And the reason we don't have prospectuses, test question, is because municipal issuers are exempt. Municipalities are allowed to sell brand new securities to the public without making a registration statement. And so the official statement is the prospectus-like document that helps you make an informed decision. Anybody know what the bond buyer is? Oh, it looks like Dean made a mistake there. Not the Don buyer. <laughs> the bond buyer. Been a long day. The Don Isn't buyer. Isn't the bond buyer the, the website where it posts the, the notice of sale? A excellent. Exactly right, Jeffrey. So the bond buyer is a newspaper widely led electronic published in that. And if you're in public finance, Jeffrey, you have to subscribe to this because, you know, how are you going to know that there is a competitive underwriting? You know, the two styles of underwriting are negotiated and competitive. And so in a competitive underwriting, what the issuer is going to do is publish a notice of sale on the bond buyer saying, attention, attention, investment bankers, we're looking for some help. And so, you know, if I work public finance at UBS, for example, I get the uh, bond buyer, I see the notice of sale, and I call uh, public finance, I call Jeffrey, let's say Jeffrey works at uh, uh, BAML, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, and I say, hey, uh, Jeffrey, Dean here, UBS, have you seen the notice of sale? He goes, yeah, woo. I said, yeah, you know, I'm forming a syndicate. Would you like to join my syndicate? And Merrill says, Dean, uh, we're forming our own syndicate. I said, ooh, say it ain't so. You know, the various syndicates. I say to Jeffrey at BAML, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, I say, hey, uh, Jeffrey, no hard feelings, no hard feelings. I mean, if you win, will you have either yourself or some other syndicate member call me? Because I still have clients who want muni bonds, and I'd be willing to join a selling group. So if you uh, have a syndicate member building a selling group, uh, I'd be interested in, uh, you know, signing up under them. And Jeffrey says, yeah, not a problem. I say, hey, if I win, Jeffrey, would you like me to call uh, you and see if uh, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch might want to help sell bonds as a non-syndicate member, as a member of the selling group? He goes, yeah, that'd be fantastic. 
Now, the one who wins is the one who provides the issuer with the lowest net interest cost. Who cares? But, you know, if we win, you know, my syndicate wins, UBS, I'm the manager, and I have a syndicate. And uh, it's kind of like network marketing. You know, you cannot get the bonds without coming through me, the manager. So let's just put that there. And let's say that I uh, told the issuer that I was going to get them 990 for the bonds. I was going to get them 990 for the bonds. Let's put that there. Boom. And uh, let's say we're going to sell these bonds at par. We're going to sell these bonds for a thousand. And so in this example, the issuer is receiving 990. And the investors are paying a thousand. To ask question, what do we call the difference between what the investors pay, the investors pay, and the issuer receives? What do we call that? Uh, spread. Right on. So what is the spread? What is the spread in this deal? What is the spread in this deal? What is the spread in this deal? Um, Because it's $10, it's um, one basis point. Well, good, good, good job, Jeffrey. You sound a little bit like almost a player, right? They almost a player there. A little bit of a baby broker still. That's a term of endearment, not derogatory. Not a basis point, a point. Now, I was going to give you grief if you told me $10 because no bond person is ever going to say $10. The spread here is one point. And remember, that is testable to know that a point is $10. So there's $10 to be made on every bond sold. You know, uh, the only person that can capture every component of the spread is the manager. So, you know, I'm UBS, I'm the manager. This is kind of like uh, the Soprano syndicate and I'm Tony Soprano, right? If I'm Tony Soprano and the Soprano syndicate, it doesn't matter who does what. I get my management fee. Tony calls it his taste. He says, I don't care who does what in the Soprano Syndicate. I expect my taste. And our business is called the management fee. So I'm going to let my syndicate members take down bonds. I'm going to let my syndicate members take down bonds at 991.25. So if you are a member of my syndicate, I will let you have these bonds for 991.25. So that means I'm going to make a dollar twenty-five on every bond sold. So what do we call what do we call that dollar twenty-five? What do we call that eighth? Right, an eighth. You know, if you don't know what an eighth is, you would take your calculator, you take one divided by eight times ten, and we'd find out that's a buck twenty-five. So what do we call that component of the spread? There are three components of the spread. We're working our way through all three of them. So what do we call that? Last question, we call that the management fee. And the management fee, test question, is typically the smallest individual component of the spread. So now if you're a member of my syndicate, if you're a member of my syndicate, you have a decision to make. Do you want to sell these bonds yourself? Do you want to sell these bonds yourself? Or do you want to get some help? And if you want to sell the bonds yourself, you can make what's called the total takedown. The total takedown is not an individual component of the spread. The total takedown is two components of the spread. 
So right here, the total takedown is seven eighths. And that's what you would make as a syndicate member if you decided to not build a bracket. You decided not to, not to sign up any selling group members. So, you know, that total takedown is two components. So let's say uh, you are my syndicate member and you say, hey, Dean, uh, I would like to build a selling group. Do uh, you have any uh, persons uh, you think might be interested in joining my bracket as a member of my selling group? Uh, let's say you are uh, Edward D. Jones. I say, yeah, why don't you call uh, Jeffrey over at BAML? You know, uh, BAML had a, had a competing syndicate they lost, but uh, they did tell me they would be interested in helping us sell bonds as a selling group member. So why don't you uh, give them a call and uh, see what you can do. And so Edward G. Jones calls Jeffrey, said, hey, uh, Dean told me to give you a call, said you were interested in joining the selling group. And Jeffrey says, yeah. He says, what can we have the bonds for? And Edward G. Jones says, you can have the bonds for $9.95. $9.95. And that means that BAML as a selling group member would make a half a point or $5, and that is called the selling concession. And that is typically the largest individual component of the spread. Be careful. Be careful. So here, uh, in my example, Edward E. Jones is going to make a 3 8 or 3 uh, 75 on a bond that somebody else sells, and that's called the additional takedown. And remember, if I ask you what's the largest component of the spread, it's the total takedown, the largest component, total takedown. Largest individual component is the selling concession. Now, uh, Edward E. Jones was uh, kind of foolish not to ask me what kind of syndicate this is. You know, because, you know, as a syndicate member, you could be liable for unsold securities. Uh, but, you know, one of the reasons you may not want to join a syndicate, you know, maybe I call Fidelity and say, hey, would you like to join the syndicate? They go, Dean, we don't want to be at risk for unsold securities. So selling group members are never liable for unsold securities. Yeah, but again, you don't, you don't make, you know, as much as everybody else. Never liable for unsold securities. All right, so let's talk about some participants. Let's talk about some participants here. You know, uh, so far we've said there's uh, three participants in this thing. We got uh, the manager. You know, the manager is uh, first among equals. The manager or managing underwriter uh, we have uh, underwriters, and we have uh, members of the selling group. And members of the selling group are not members of uh, the syndicate. And so uh, your choices based on this exhibit, this is called an exhibit, is to uh, tell me who you are based on what I told you the compensation is. I said, now I'm going to say you made X number of dollars selling a bond. Who were you? Who were you? So we're going to play that game here in just a sec. Uh, before we do, let's just put these fractions into dollar prices. Boom. Boom. All right, so let's try the game. You made an eighth. You made an eighth on a bond that someone else sold. You made an eighth on a bond that someone else sold. And you were at risk for unsold securities. Were you A, the manager, B, the underwriter, or C, a member of a selling group? You made an eighth on a bond that someone else sold. Right on, you're the manager. You're the manager. Be careful. Uh, oh, yeah, Carla. Carla was taking her seven. I was worried because we had Mary sell. I don't know if you're still here, but if you're an SIE person, you probably shouldn't be watching this, you know, because this is, <laughs> this is way, 
way north of the SIE. So, uh, you know, if you're not taking a seven, I would probably, you know, not be listening to this. I'd probably uh, go get dinner or whatever you're going to do. All right. So indeed, it's the manager. All right. So let's make it a little trickier here. So we're getting tests on the components of the spreads. I could say what's the smallest individual will be management fee. Uh, okay, let's try it again. Your firm made a half a point, made a half a point, and was not at risk for unsold securities. Your firm made a half a point, it was not at risk for unsold securities. Was your firm a manager, underwriter, a member of the selling group? Indeed, member of the selling group, right? By the way, there is a test question where they'd say there was X number of bonds. They'll say, uh, you know, you're, you have to first figure out the question that you remember the selling group and they say you sold 50,000 bonds. And so you, if you can get the $5, then you got the answer, right? Because you would take the five times 50,000 bonds and say, I'll just get my calculator. You tell me on the test that my firm sold 50,000 bonds, made $5 a bond, they made $250,000. All right, a little trickier, a little trickier. Uh, your firm, your firm made a point. Your firm captured every component of the spread. Who was your firm? The manager, the underwriter, or remember the selling group? Jeffrey, right on, right? The only person who can capture the entire spread and every component of it is the manager. These are the bonds that I, UBS, sell through my own distribution network. On those bonds, I make it all. You know, I saw a Soprano Syndicate uh, episode once and Tony did his own deal and he captured the entire spread. And his nephew, said, Chris, said, aren't we going to split this uh, spread with the other members of our syndicate? And he said, well, you're confused, my friend. I don't kick down. People kick up. If I do the deal, I'm keeping it all. Right. So the only person who can capture every component of the spread is the manager. Okay, let's uh, do a little trick here. A little trick here. You made, you made three-eighths, three-eighths on a bond that some other firm sold and you were at risk for unsold securities. You made three eighths, your broker dealer made three eighths on a bond that some other firm sold and you were at risk for unsold securities. Yeah, that's the underwriter, right? That's UBS and these are the bonds that are, excuse me, Edward D. Jones and these are the bonds that Edward D. Jones gave to Bank of America. Uh, remember, at Edward D. Jones, I'm going to sell some of the bonds myself through my own distribution network, and I would make the additional takedown and the selling concession, and that's called the total takedown. And again, the total takedown would be seven-eighths here, and that's what I make as a member of the syndicate. Now, what if uh, Bamel Jeffrey says to Edward D. Jones, well, gee, you know, I'm going to go get these bonds direct from Dean at 991.25, and you say, no, you're not. The only people who can get the bonds for 990 to 125 are members of the syndicate. You're either a member of the syndicate or you're not. By the way, even if you call me, Jeffrey calls me. He says, Hey, Dean, yet where D. Jones call me. What a you know, what a clown. I don't want to do business with that guy. You know, I want to do business with you. I say, okay, Jeffrey, I'll let you have some bonds. Uh, 995. He goes, 995. You know, other people are paying 991.25. I go, well, yeah, Jeffrey, but you're not a member of my syndicate. You know, if you're not a member of my syndicate, I can put you in my selling group, but I can't be, you know, cutting side deals with people. You're going to have to pay $9.95. So uh, let's try that one as a test question. Your firm made a half a point, a half a point, on a bond that someone else sold and was at risk for unsold securities. Your firm made a half a point. on a bond that some other firm sold and you were at risk for unsold securities. That's the manager again, right? That's the manager. And this is bonds I gave to my selling group, right? So there I'm capturing two components and then my selling group member is getting the uh, rest of that. Okay. So uh, I think that's a nice overview of this. Uh, we can do some more on this. And uh, what you should ask me is what kind of syndicate are you joining? What are the two types of syndicates in muni bonds? What are the two types of syndicates and muni bonds? Um, firm commitment. Well, yes, uh, firm commitment, we usually associate 
with what's called a divided syndicate. Yeah. Uh, so Western and Eastern. There you go. And to be honest with you, you probably should have asked me that before you, you know, signed up to sell some stuff, right? You know, when I think of divided, I think of like uh, John Wayne, Clint Eastwood, mano a mano. You tell me you're going to do something, you're going to do something. You know, uh, when I think undivided, that's known as Eastern. I think of Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Mafia. You know, they're always in it together. You know, I had some very classy ladies uh, who are in public finance. And I thought it was funny. They said, you know, I think of it as a family dinner. You know, in a Western family dinner, I just got to eat my own meal. And then I get to leave the table. But in an Eastern syndicate, we keep passing it around. And nobody leaves until it's all gone. <laughs> so, uh, so let's say we're doing a $100 million deal. Just made that up. And I say to uh, my friends at Edward G. Jones, how much do you want to take down? How many bonds do you want to take down from the syndicate? How much do you want to take down? Now, remember, if this is a Western syndicate, you know, if my example, Edward D. Jones says they want to take down $20 million worth of these bonds, you know, boom, they're taking down, I'll just make this up, 20 million, right? And uh, I call them, I'm checking in, I'm the manager, and I'm checking in with Edward D. Jones. And I said, how are you doing on your 20 million? And they goes, well, Dean, we, I said, what, you got a mouse in your pocket? There's no we in a divided syndicate. You are individually responsible for selling these bonds. Right? So you say, uh, Dean, we uh, did 15 million. I said, no, you didn't. You did 20. You know, you did 15 million. I go, well, Dean. What happens to the other five that we didn't sell? They go to bond heaven? I go, no, they go to inventory, right? Attention brokers, blue light specials. So if you were able to sell $15 million worth of these bonds, you are still liable for the other 5 million. As you know, as I said, what goes down stays down. You know, if I call you, maybe I call you and say, hey, we have other syndicate members. You go, well, Dean, I said I'd do 20. I did 20. Now, if this was a Eastern syndicate, your liability is based on percentage participation. So now it's not important that it's 20 million. What's important is that that's 20% of the deal, right? So now that's what's gonna be important here. That's $20 million worth of bonds. And that is 20% of the deal. And that's the liability. So, you know, I call you, I'm the manager, I'm checking in with you. And I say, hey, listen, everybody else sold theirs. You know, uh, how are you doing? And you said, Dean, we sold 10. I go, oh, you're not going to be very popular. And the reason you're not going to be very popular is because I'm going to take the 10 back from you. And I'm going to reallocate it to our syndicate members based on their percentage. So I take back the 10. I said, here's two of the 10 for you to chew on. And I'm going to keep re you know, allocating these things. Uh, let's try uh, this version, right? Same thing. And I call you and I say, how are you doing? You said, Dean, we uh, sold 20 million, we're done. I said, well, if only it were true, you're not done. In fact, what I'm doing right now is reallocating bonds. So, you know, we're happy that you did 20 million, but remember that wasn't what you're liable for. You're liable for 20% of the deal. And so I have some bonds for you. And you say, well, how many bonds do you have for me? I said, well, let's see how you did on your series seven. Uh, I'm reallocating bonds, and I have $20 million of bonds I'm reallocating. So 20% to $20 million, here's four more million dollars for you, right? So again, we just keep reallocating that until it all gets uh, sold, right? Uh, any questions on uh, this underwriting? This is a pretty thorough job, I think, of uh, underwriting as it relates to uh, passing this part of your Series 7. Anything else on this? Okay, well, uh, our overtime sessions go 
for 45 uh, minutes, and that is indeed 45 minutes, but I am uh, more than happy. What kicked off this thing was the types of documents that we would find, and we were working our way before we took that little side trip through underwritings on the distinctions between geos and revenues. And so uh, anything else that you can think of that we want to add to the uh, distinctions between geos and revenues? Oh, I could think of a couple like feasibility study. Where does a feasibility study go? What geos or revenues? Revenues. Right on, right? So, I mean, you know, boom. Uh, where does a double barrel go? Is a double barrel a type of geo or a revenue? I think that's a geo. Right on, remember, because the second barrel, the second promise is the full faith and credit, right? Uh, where does uh, IDA or IDR go? An industrial development agency bond or an industrial development revenue bond? Revenue. Right on. Now that's testable. Because industrial development agency bonds, IDAs, or IDRs are not supporting a public purpose. They are supporting a private activity. And so this becomes a suitability question, right? I say, listen, are you subject to the AMT? Are you subject to the alternative minimum tax? Because if you are, this would be an inappropriate recommendation to you because it would be taxable, right? The number one reason people are buying muni bonds is because the interest is tax-free, federally tax-exempt. Is the interest you receive from either a geo or, or a revenue? By the way, if it's if it's a revenue like an airport, no problem. But if it's, you know, uh, we're building a corporate campus for Schwab in Denver, 80-acre campus, and Schwab is going to now occupy it and start paying rent, that's finance, that 80-acre campus of so Schwab is financed through the issuance of industrial development agency bonds. And if I'm selling that to you as a resident of Colorado, I need to make sure you're not subject to the AMT. Uh, all right. So in terms of uh, taxes, uh, is the uh, muni bonds very testable, tax exempt uh, on the state and local level? So our municipal, yes. well, you jumped a little too quickly. You should have said it depends. There we go. Jeffrey said it depends. <laughs> Right. So be careful. You don't squeeze triggers too quickly. Right. So let's see if Jeffrey knows what it depends on. Well, Jeffrey, what does it depend on uh, whether it's going to be state and local tax free? If the customer is a resident of that state. Right on. So if you are a resident of California, for example, California could tax you, but chooses not to. To give you an incentive to invest in California and political subdivisions of California. If you buy a Nevada bond, California can and will tax you. All right, so I say, I'd like to diversify you geographically outside the state of California. Is there an issuer that no matter where I live in the United States of America would be exempt at every lo level, local, if there's a city income tax like Philadelphia or New York, state, Pennsylvania or New York, California, and federal government, is there any bonds that no matter where you live could be triple exempt if you have a city income tax? Um, right on, Jeffrey. He says PR. I'm sure that means Puerto Rico. Jeffrey, if okay. anybody wants Puerto Rico to be a state, it's other states so we can start taxing them. The federal <laughs> government could tax you on Puerto Rican debt, but chooses not to, to give you an incentive to invest in Puerto Rico. San Juan, Puerto Rico. Are we clear? Genoa, Alaska is not a territory of the United States government. Are we clear? Honolulu, Hawaii is not a territory of the United States government. San Juan, Puerto Rico. Now on the test, we won't give you the U.S. Virgin Islands. We won't give you U.S. Micronesia. It'll be Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico. Right on, right on. That's so why you buy the muni bonds is collect that federally tax exempt interest. All right. Well, I think that's pretty good. A little overtime on the overtime session. Anything else here that we can think of off the bat? We could certainly think of more things that we we put our mind to it. We could put, for example, um, 
Uh, on the GO side, we could uh, talk about uh, demographics and uh, unfunded pension liabilities, and we could talk about uh, overlapping debt. Go terminus. Right, so we could think of a lot of things probably we just uh, put our mind to it. Uh, what I'm suggesting, by the way, I know some of you are testing next week. Uh, again, when you're reviewing this, take a sheet of paper, fold it in half as you go through the review. Every time you run into a term that goes on one side or the other, put it put it there. You know, and then you'll have a nice little kind of a cheat sheet on, uh, you know, geos versus revenues. Uh, any other questions? Uh, you tell me, Jeffrey, debt limits. Uh, I, I was teaching today, Jeffrey, so I'll just tell you. And a lot of people like Jeffrey put question marks in the chat. And I always tell my class, I'm telling you now, Jeffrey, you could just put an exclamation point and I'll know it's a question mark. Because what I want you to be is confident. And you are absolutely right. Jet, jet limits go to a GO, right? So even if you have a question mark on the test, you want to pretend like you're going down in flames, you're going with your answer, you're sticking with it, you're answering quickly and correctly. That's what the mindset you want to have. So you are correct. That limits are for GO. So, you know, in the future, if you're joining me for one of these or even the class today, I said, everybody, please put an explanation point instead of a question mark. P.S. Even in class today, almost everybody who had a question mark, they were correct. Right. When I'm tutoring people, it's I have to tell people, though, you know, I, when we're tutoring, I want you to talk out loud because I got to hear what you're thinking. Right. And sometimes they'll have a like a question mark in their own voice. I'm like, well, listen, you got to get rid of that kind of questioning thing. You, know, you just got to go with it hard. Right. Yes, I know this. I know this. And this is my answer. So you are correct, Jeffrey. You are correct. Any other uh, questions or comments before we uh, call it at end of this overtime session? Okay, well, thanks for joining me. Uh, we typically uh, do these like every other Tuesday. So uh, I know we're going to have uh, people passing the test, but uh, you know, then we put it as a replay afterwards. So about every other Tuesday is when we do this. Uh, I'm just looking here. Uh, Carla is, uh, I'm not sure if Carla, Carla, are you a paid student? How come that looks familiar to me? Yes. <laughs> you are. Okay, because I, I know, I know, I know, I'm not sure who I've, had tutoring. But anyways, what I was going to tell you, if you are a paid student, I think Cynthia is a paid student too. I, Cynthia, did you take a class for me? One of our evening classes? No? Yes? Well, anyways, the reason I ask is Carla has access to free office hours too. So uh, this is free for anybody, but we also have free office hours for people who either bought a class uh, from myself or for Kaplan or tutoring. And those uh, are available as well. But that's uh, that's for you know, paid people. Uh, this is free for everybody. So any other questions? Is the office hours after this or what's this? Uh, they're in the schedule. You can see them on the schedule, Carla. So if you go to the schedule, you'll see uh, just where you signed up for this, there's, there's, it will be class and okay. it'll say free office hour. And I cap it at five because uh, I kept this at 10. We had 10, but I don't know what happened. It's like an airline flight, but I try not to get too many people because, you know, if we get a gazillion people on here. You know, it, it's not as productive, you know, I find. So I kept the office hours at five and I kept this at 10. You know, I got like, you know, 40 something people in my SIE class. And, you know, I know Kaplan likes it because they make a lot of money, but it's, you know, for in terms of learning, it's it's not as productive as, you know, a dozen of us perhaps, you know, so <laughs> anything else? No. no, thank you so much. Dean. Thank you. You're about, welcome. My pleasure. My pleasure. So. Uh, if you guys who are testing, remember, don't uh, don't lose touch. It's it's not a transaction. It's a relationship. So, uh, you know, uh, make sure you, you, you stay in touch as you go down that back nine. And I think I'm uh, seeing, uh, Carla, I think I'm seeing you Sunday, right? Is that right? Or who am I seeing? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Right? <laughs> I'm sorry. This week has been just crazy. So, um, all right, everybody, I'll see you next time. And uh, like I say, remember, inch by inch, your series seven or whatever exam you're taking is a cinch. Yard by yard, it's hard, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.